not only did he have a relationship with the government, but he had a mole in the FBI. In this world, you look out for number one. If you, if any people, take that oath to the grave. These guys are on the streets, so they're involved in, in hustling. Welcome back to the Original Gangsters Podcast. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato with my co-host Scott Bernstein. Hey now. And our producer, Signore Roberto Boschain. Hey now. Uh, we're super excited to have Michael Francis as our guest today. He is a true uh, original gangster. He was born into mafia royalty, um, and then he ended up becoming one of the most prolific earners in the in the history of, of Cosa Nostra. Not only one of the biggest earners within the Colombo family, but one of the biggest earners in all of the five families. It's really remarkable, and we'll talk to him and about what that. I, what, I, what I'm most interested about uh, Mr. Francis, and we're going to get him here and be able to pick his brain, but he really changed the whole paradigm. I mean, he took the mob in New York from the streets into the boardroom and, and taught really the rest of the five families how to be white collar criminals. And that, that right. was such, that was such a big part of the evolution of the mob uh, today. And this was something that, you know, Michael uh, and his, his crew were doing back in the seventies and eighties. Yeah. That's definitely something we want to ask him about. And, and eventually the state did come after him. He did some time in prison, uh, a lot of time. And when he came out, he was one of the few individuals I'm aware of who actually walked away from the life and lived to tell about it. And he has since reinvented himself. And now he's a well-known author, television producer, film producer, ins motivational speaker, minister, among other things. He's really led a remarkable life. So we're really happy to have Michael on with us. Uh, welcome, Michael, to the Original Gangsters podcast. Thank you, guys. Good to be here. Thank you, Michael. Um, so if we could talk a little bit about you know your early history. You had this this inter interesting situation where, sort of like Michael Corleone in The Godfather, um, you were not initially supposed to be part of the family business. You were attending college, uh, studying uh, pre medicine, I believe. And just to fill the audience in real quick, Michael's dad, oh, uh, yes. John Sonny Francis, is right. one of the most legendary. Uh, mob figures in the history of America, in the history of New York. He's still alive. He's 102 years old, um, and you know he is a true legends legend uh, in, in the world of organized crime. So, so Michael grew up uh, as mob royalty, as, as Jimmy uh, mentioned in the intro. Yeah. So his, his father was it was and is a big deal. So unpack that for us, Michael. How, how you were really you you were initially not on that track, and then and then circumstances changed, and then you did find yourself in the life. Yeah, that's correct. I mean, my dad didn't want this life for me initially. Uh, he wanted me out of it, actually. He wanted me to go to school, you know, have a, pro a profession, a career. He wanted me to uh, to be a doctor. And I was also an athlete in school. He was very supportive of that. And, um, you know, I was on that road. I was actually a pre-med student in Hofstra University in New York. And my dad got in some very serious trouble. He was indicted, you know, over the years, several times, three times in the state of New York, went to trial, was acquitted on some very serious charges. But then he was indicted in federal court in 1966 for masterminding a nationwide string of bank robberies. He was convicted, sentenced to 50 years in prison. And in 1970, he went off to, to do his time. And, you know, just to set it up, I love my dad. He was my hero growing up. He was my idol. You know, like I said, very supportive of me. So when he drew that sentence and went in, he was 50 when he went in. He had 50 on top of that. I figured, you know, he was going to die in prison. So, you know, I felt responsible in a way to try to help him out. And um, around that time, Joe Colombo had started the Italian-American Civil Rights League. And obviously we were very close because my dad was his underboss. And he kind of took me under his wing. I would meet a lot of my dad's friends. We'd talk about my father's situation because, guys, I will tell you this. You know, we'll get into that later. I went to, a, to jail for a crime that I was guilty of. I pled guilty. I did my time. Big racketeering case. Uh, my father did, obviously, a lot of, you know, bad things in his life. That's part of the life. We both did. But that particular case that he was convicted on, my dad was framed on. He yep. was no bank robber. It was a bad case. I'll take that to my grave. And, uh, and I knew that, and I wanted to help him out. And it was because of that that he proposed me for membership in the life when I was 21 years old. He just thought that was a better way for me to help him uh, get out of prison and not die in there. So that's how the thing turned around for me. And you, you got made on Halloween night, is that correct? Yeah, it was Halloween night in 1975. Can you kind of just take us through that, maybe uh, maybe a one or two minute synopsis of, of what that sure. ceremony was like? 
Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was late at night. Obviously, when you, you conduct a ceremony like that, you got to make sure there's no surveillance and, uh, you know, it's done in secret. So that's taken very seriously and, and precautionary steps are taken. And uh, it was actually in uh, Anthony Colombo had a, a catering hall in Brooklyn. Uh, it was called El Doro at the time, and that's where the, this, the uh, ritual ceremony was held. There were six of us that night that were recruits for, you know, a, a couple of years. We had to prove ourselves worthy. And, um, you know, I'll set it up. Uh, we went in. It was late at night. It was around midnight, and uh, the room was dimly lit. Uh, they wanted you to understand the seriousness of what you were getting involved in. And the boss was seated at the head of, like, a horseshoe configuration, Underboss consigliere to his left and right, and all the captains were alongside of them. We had about fifteen in our family. At so, that who time. was the, the boss at that time? Was that Junior Perse- Persico? Well, Persico was was the boss, but he was in prison. So Tom DeBella was the acting boss at okay. the time, and he he conducted that ceremony for me. And uh, you know, I walked down the aisle, stood in front of the boss, held out my hand. He took a knife, cut my finger. Some blood dropped on the floor. This is a blood oath. I cupped my hands, he took a picture of a saint, a Catholic altar card, put it in my hands and lit it aflame. It didn't hurt, it burned quickly, it was merely symbolic. And he said, tonight, Michael Francis, you are born again into a new life, into La Cosa Nostra. Violate what you know about this life, betray your brothers, and you will die and burn in hell like the saint is burning in your hands. And, you know, do you accept? And I said, yes, I do. That's how it started for me. The other five guys went in, they all took the oath, and you come into the life, you come in as a soldier, and uh, that's when I was ready to start my my time in that life. How, how quickly did you ascend uh, up up the up the ladder? Uh, and and w- when were you promoted to, to captain status? Well, you know, when I got into the life, uh, I think you, you you fellas probably know that, but they had an expression that the books had been closed right. uh, since the early fifties, meaning they weren't bringing any new guys into the family, and that was. Uh, all five families had agreed to that. It was more of a security reason than anything else. But um, then in the early 70s, they opened the books, and that's when they started making guys again, and the families were building up. So when I came in, I was one of the younger guys. There was guys that had waited 20 and 30 years to be made. So I was one of the younger guys. But, you know, I was, uh, I was fortunate. I knew how to use that life to benefit me in business. I was very aggressive. Uh, I worked, you know, 24-7 practically, and, and I brought some new things into the family because I had kind of a head to business and add that into some of the benefits that you get being part of that life, and I was really able to like, capitalize on that and, and make the most of it. So, you know, it took me five years before Persico elevated me to the position of captain of Copper Regime, and that was in 1980. And there's no ceremony for that. I mean, boss says you're a captain, that's it, you're a captain, and he appointed me a, a, a couple of guys in my crew, and I also had my own crew. You know, all my associates that were uh, weren't made, but they were they were my guys, and uh, and we just moved on from there. And and before you were officially inducted, um, you, you had some experience not only from just being around your father, but weren't you present at the assassination of Joe Colombo? Yeah, I was there. Um, you know, that was the Italian American Civil Rights League rally. It was the, actually the second big rally that we had in Columbus Circle. I think it was in 71. And um, we had upwards of 30,000 people there. It was a big event. And, and Joey had a big stage set up right around the, the statue of Columbus in the middle of the circle. And I had gone up on the stage. He called me because he wanted me to give out some uh, brochures that we had um, by Lincoln Center there around 61st Street. So he had handed them to me. And, uh, you know, I'll never forget because uh, I was a little bit disillusioned because I thought that enough wasn't being done to help my dad at that time. And I really got involved in the league to try to help my father because, you know, we were picking in the FBI and doing all that stuff. And uh, he turned to me and he said, Michael, don't worry, this league is going to help your father out big time. And I was excited by that. I said, wow, you know, this, is, this is great. And I walked away from him. I was heading to the steps to go down the stage when the uh, when the shots rang out. Obviously, we know what happened from there. He was he was shot and you know eventually died from the wounds. But uh, it was uh, you know it was a day I'll never forget. I mean, it was certainly my first major experience uh, with something like that in that life. Can you describe Joe Colombo as a boss? What were you know kind of his best features, his worst features? What what was the uh, what did the rank and file think of him? Well, you know, there was mixed emotions uh, or mixed reactions, I should say, as a result of his involvement in the league and the way he 
you know, came out so uh, publicly with the fact that, you know, there was no mafia, and he wasn't the boss, and he was a legitimate guy, and he was doing all sorts of television shows, and, and you know, it was frowned upon, i got to be honest with you. There was a lot of negative talk about it, especially among the men. I mean, I remember being on the picket line, and guys really complaining that he had us on picket lines, and the FBI was taking pictures, and guys were going to get in trouble over it, so... There was a lot of dissension uh, as a result of that. Prior to that, you know, again, a lot of people thought that maybe he wasn't the guy deserving of that position. Um, I think, you know, how he got it, he, he did a favor for Carlo Gambino, basically, and, and they supported him and taking over the family. And, you know, there's a little more to it we don't have to get into. But um, There had been a big war, just to let the audience know, there had been a, a giant mob war in the Colombo family, which at the time was called the Profaci family in the 60s, and kind of at the end of the war, tell me if I'm telling the story correctly, at the end of the war, Colombo was like one of the last men standing and was able to kind of uh, assume power, but he wasn't one of the main combatants. Is that correct? Yeah, I don't want to say he was the last man standing. I don't think that's accurate. But, you know, he politically, he made the right moves. And a lot of this life is politics. And he got the right support from Carlo and, and the, you know, the guys that meant something. And he was able to take over the family. Look, I'll be honest with you. There was a lot of people that thought my father should have had that position. Yeah, mm-hmm. we've heard that. Um, yeah, a lot of people that thought that. and um, But he didn't. And, um you know, once you're the boss, you're the boss. And I, that's I, it. And people will respect it. I think a lot of people that study the world like we do, there's been a lot of, um, I don't want to say Monday morning quarterbacking might be the wrong term, but kind of thinking like if what happened with your father hadn't have happened, if he hadn't have got jammed up in the bank robbery uh, conspiracy and he had been allowed to ascend to, to the boss's chair, uh, let's say in the late 60s, early 70s, what would the landscape of the entire New York underworld be like, but specifically the Columbos who have been somewhat of a dysfunctional group on and off. They had the, the kind of the two wars in the sixties and early seventies. And then there was another giant war that erupted in the 1990s. Kind of what would you, what, what's your take if things would have gone differently and Sonny would have become boss? Uh, how would the family have looked now, you know, 40 years later, 50 years later, and how would the New York underworld look? How would it well, be different? Let, let me say this. I, I think my, my, and I'm not saying this because I'm his son. Look, I'm, I'm not a kid anymore. And I've been through a lot. You know, my dad and I have been through a lot together, but I will say that, you know, my father had very, very capable leadership qualities. Uh, he was well liked, um, by not only people in our family, but in the other families, he was well respected because my dad was, was a doer. You know, he, he did what he, what he had to do. He was a pretty even handed guy. Um, he knew how to, you know, politically, he knew how to navigate that life. So he had all the, the qualities and, and I think he would have been a very good boss. And I think he would have gotten a lot of respect from, from the other families and our family would have done well under him. No, no doubt about it. But, you know, um, Is what, would, have if, 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 or, would what have happened you know, in the nineties happened if, if Sonny was, was in charge. I mean, you had a lot of bodies drop in the early '90s because of that war, and it was really bad yeah. public relations for that for, for the Borgata. I don't think we would have had the war. I, I don't think my father would have been challenged. Uh, I really don't. You know, and I, I just see how he he dealt with people. You know, and, and, and I think he would have been able to keep peace among the look. Our family was a warring family. I think you know that. We we always had a lot of stuff going on. You know. And uh, I, I think my father would have been able to keep that at bay. I, I really do. Now, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a prophet. I don't know for sure. But I, I just think he commanded that type of respect to have really let that family grow. And, he, you know, he wasn't a greedy guy. Look, my, my father was known as being tight. You know, he liked to term other people's money. He didn't like to dip into his pocket to go into business and all of that. But neither was he the guy that was taking from you. So he let people earn. He, so, he was. Would you um, would you agree with the categorization of your father that he he was that rare breed of someone that was beloved, respected, and feared? And when you're when when you have that trifecta in the underworld, you can really go far. Yes, uh, I believe that, and, and I saw that in him. I really did, and I and again, uh, you know, I didn't see that in many other guys, and and I got around a lot because you know we'll, we'll probably get into that, but when I was in the gas business. You know, I made a lot of relationships as a result of that. So I, I met with a lot of high, high-end guys, and I, I, you know, I know the deal. I mean, and my father was a rare guy. He, he stood out. He really did. So, 
Uh, he was beloved. He certainly was feared because they knew that he, you know, he wasn't hesitant to do whatever he had to do. And he was known for that. And so I think uh, I think the family would have been much better off if he were in control. I really do. And if we can uh, fast forward to, you know, your tenure, um, you mentioned uh, the, the the gas scheme, which which I want to talk about. But before we do that, so our listeners understand, if you, if you think about wise guys as someone maybe um, – Shaking down a pizzeria, or um, you know, uh, uh, running a, a crabs game or something—that was not Michael. <laughs> Michael was at a whole different level of the game. Um, I know that Ed McDonald, who was a uh, U.S. attorney, says has, has gone on record saying he thinks Michael was was the most prolific earner um, in all of the five families. Not smartest just the, wise guy, in right, New York. right? Not just the Colombo uh, family. So, if you could talk about one. How you transition to the sort of these sort of thinking bigger than just uh, you know shaking down a, a pizzeria place and and one example I can think of that I'm aware of uh, was the shipping container scam that that you were involved in which I just it is brilliant I mean and I say that in a sort of perverse way I'm not I'm not condoning what you did but it just strikes me as really cutting edge for a, a wise guy to come up with that but kind also of scam. when when we watch movies like Wall Street and Wolf of Wall Street. You were the perfect age in the perfect era to make all that happen. Yeah, well, so if you could true. talk to us about that, Michael. Thank you. Sure. You know, look, I, I'm going to be honest. I mean, I my targets were never the guy on the street. You know, I, I didn't believe in extorting a, a shop owner or a family or anything else. I mean, the only the only street people that I thought had to answer to me and it was only right, were, were bookmakers. Because, you know, bookmakers, we just wouldn't allow them to operate unless they operated under our control. And for most of the, re- for most of the time, that was a benefit to them. Because remember, bookmakers, they give credit. They have to collect. And if they don't have power behind them, quite often they can't collect. And so it was an advantage for them to be part of, of my system, so to speak. So if they needed money, I'd lend it to them. And then we had collection issues. Uh, we, we made sure they collected their money. But other than that, you know, I didn't believe in extorting shop owners or going after families. I, I hated anything to do with drugs. We couldn't do anything with drugs. Anyhow, we got killed if we, we messed with drugs. And that's that was around all five families, even though some guys were doing it on a sly. We were not supposed to do it. So I didn't believe in any of that. My targets were always big. I always, if I can go down, take the government down, I'm ready. Let me hear the scheme. Let me create the scheme. I'm ready to go. Because you got to remember, I hated the government at that point. They framed my dad. I've seen him my whole life. You know, to me, they were harassing us our whole life. So it's like I'm getting even. You know, insurance companies point me in that direction. I'm ready to take them down if I could. At that time, I want to make this clear for your listeners. Not today, but back then. Mm-hmm. And the banks, you know, banks, the same thing. You know, so those are my main targets as far as if I was going to defraud anybody or take anybody down, you know, aside, and, and I did on all three, I'll be honest. But aside from that, you know, I had really, I had a head for legitimate business. You know, I was into a lot of different things. I was into the film business. I was in general contracting. I owned a number of automobile dealerships. I had a big leasing company. Um, you know, I was really into that. If somebody came to me with an idea um, I was ready to think about it, expand on it, and try to make it work. And I just enjoyed it. You know, I was entrepreneurial in that regard. So, yeah, I mean, I, I you know, if they came to me with scores and stuff like that, I, I really turned it deaf ear. I wasn't really interested. Is there any way, Mike, just for the sake of the uh, uh, audience, can you do like a maybe a 90 second or two minute breakdown of the gas scam? Sure. So we don't go too far into yeah. it, but just let people kind of yeah, know sure. what it was. It's pretty fascinating. There, there were two elements to the business. Number one, okay, when we first started out, the tax on every gallon of gasoline, both federal, state, local, was being collected at the gas station level. Whoever owned the gas station was responsible on a monthly basis to pay the tax, state, local, and federal. So we devised a scheme to uh, defraud the government and prevent them from collecting the tax for between 10 months to a year. When they finally came down after the 10 months or a year, We would close that station down. The owner would be gone. Uh, We'd keep it vacant for a month, and then a new tenant would come in and lease it and start all over again. That's the first way. Government got wise to that, and they said, okay, we're not going to allow that anymore. You're going to have to be a wholesaler. You're going to have to be licensed. 
you're going to collect the tax and you're going to be responsible to pay us on a quarterly basis. So when they did that, we had to devise a scheme, number one, to uh, be able to get licenses, to, to be able to you know, have companies that could be licensed and then figure out a way to hold the government off again so that we can collect the tax and not pay them for a certain amount of time uh, until they came down on us. And then how do we get away with that and how do we continue the operation? So when that happened, it actually got a lot better for us. And long story short, I had 18 companies that were licensed to collect tax on every gallon of gasoline. You guys were clearing tens of millions of dollars. At the height of, I ran that operation for about eight years, close to eight years. I had the Russians involved, as you know. And at the height of our operation, we were selling a half a billion gallons of gas a month. We were taking down 20, 30, 40 cents a gallon, depending upon the deal. So we were bringing in, at one point in time, five, eight, ten million dollars a week. And it was real money. And, you know, if you have gas, you have money. It's the same thing, because gas converts to money in, in a second. So, you know, I had storage tanks that I bought from British Petroleum. We had a, a, a big terminal in Oceanside, Long Island. I had a number of gas stations I still either leased or owned or operated in some way. And we were selling to everybody that we could sell to. And, uh, you know, I couldn't get enough gas. We were buying them uh, barges that were coming over from the Middle East. And we were buying them from all the majors. We bought them from Shell and Mobil and, and all the big companies. They were selling the gas to us. So... Um, it, it was one of a kind. I, I don't think they'll ever see, unless, you know, with the new technology and stuff that's going on online that I don't really understand too much, but I don't think there'll be another operation uh, like that for my former life. I, I really don't. So under the curve. And, and then there's a, another interesting situation here. You were talking about so much of the life is politics, where initially you're earning so much money for the organization that that you're one of the most popular guys you know around but then that paranoia sets in and they start suspecting that you're not kicking up as much as as maybe you should be and didn't they call you into a sit down one time that was a pretty precarious a situation if if you could talk to us about that yeah i mean look you know it's like anything else in that life it's one of the things that uh, you know it's one of the i don't know what to call one of the the banes of that life is that like anything else, you know, I was one of the younger guys. I'm making a lot of money. I got a jet plane. I got a helicopter. I got a big crew. I got, you know, a 10,000 square foot house in, in Long Island. So, you know, people start to get a little resentful. They start to get a little weary of you. It just, it just happens. It's normal in that life. You don't even have to do anything wrong. It just comes with the territory. And, um, you know, I, I forget. I think it was Newsday. I'm not sure. Uh, came out with a story that I was becoming powerful enough to break off from the Columbos and stop my whole family. It may have, it, it could have been a, a fictionalized novel. There was no truth to it whatsoever. I, I don't know how they dreamed that up, but, um, you know, that starts to get in people's heads. And, you know, I think what happened with Persico, my former boss, is that, you know, my father was coming out on parole. I got this big crew. I got the Russians that are close to me, and I was selling gas like crazy, making millions. And I think they got a little, you know, concerned that maybe I would try to make a move, especially with my dad coming home. So, yeah, I got that call. You know, one of the horrors in that life is that you get called into a room. You may have made a mistake. You don't know. Your best friend walks you in. You don't walk out again. And uh, I got that call one night, and uh, I'll be honest with you guys, you know, I'm not ashamed to say it. I, I was scared, you know, walking into that room. I thought that could be it for me. And uh, obviously, I'm here, you know, and I got grilled with the business. Um, I'll I tell you what happened. You know, I started to get a little mad. And, um, you know, I'm sitting with the boss, and, you know, they're questioning me. And my take on this was, listen, I created this scheme. I brought you more money than you've ever seen in your life. I'm taking all the risk. I got a guy around me. I don't know if he's going to stand up or not at the end. Nobody can get in trouble but me. I protected everybody, and now you're questioning me like I did something wrong. So I started to get a little, you know, upset. And then I realized, hey, I'm talking to the boss. You know, I, it looks like I'm going to walk out of here. Don't let me make it worse for myself. <laughs> so, you know, everything went okay. And, you know, we got a bottle of wine and all that stuff afterwards. It was all all right. But I, I think it was really designed to let me know that, hey, we're the boss, you know, you are who you are, but don't get out of control here, and, and just to put me in my place. And I, honestly, it actually had the reverse effect on me. So, how so? What Can you expand well, on that? Yeah, you know, don't get me wrong, not that I was going to do anything 
uh, to anybody as a result. But, you know, I said to myself, look, I got to worry about this. I'm doing all, in my mind, I'm doing the right thing here, and I got to worry about people challenging me. I put it in the back of my mind, and it kind of gave me a, a, a bitter taste. And, you know, I didn't meet my wife until two years later. But, you know, something else happened in that incident that I thought, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure, not that I thought, I know that my father actually betrayed me at that time also. And I just filed it away. But I can tell you this, guys, I really believe with all my heart that if that incident didn't happen, I probably would not have walked away from the life. Well, I, I see just, what you're saying. It, it soured you on the, on the experience. It, it did. Right. It really did. So, but that, if we can back up for a moment, you said something interesting is that my understanding is that w w your father also had a, a sit down and, and he didn't go to bat for you. Is that, is that correct? He, he did not. You know, he, um, he, he took the high road and, and kind of threw me under the bus. And I know it for a fact. I'm not dreaming it up, you know. And uh, it, it was hurtful. I'm mean, going to be honest. I mean, it just. And it just said to me, you know, look, I mean, if this life can separate father and son, and he and I never really had a disagreement, ever. Do you think there was some jealousy um, there that your father's sitting behind bars and you're you know, living a life where you're really kind of blowing up in, in his world, blowing up in a positive way? Um, do you think there was a little bit like, wow, he's exceeding me? You know, is Sonny saying that from behind bars? Like, You know what? I honestly don't think so. But I, I will tell you this. You know, this is very personal, but I'll share it because it's not the first time I'm saying it. I don't say it often. But I think my mother had a lot to do with it. My mother was a strange woman uh, in some ways. And I think that she might have, you know, put things in my dad's head because my dad wasn't like that. I mean, he was happy for me. He he. You know, he knew, I mean, he wanted me to be a boss. He was. He said, look, I'm going to support you. I'm going to elevate you to be the boss of the family. Um, because he knew if, if I was the boss, he was the boss. Same thing. So, uh, and, you know, and he, he had the government to worry about because he was on parole for the rest of his life. So um, I, I don't think that that was my father. I honestly don't. Um, I, I just, you got, you got to understand my father. Um he just takes the high road all the time. And I think what he did that night, he didn't, he didn't, you know, say bad things about me. What he said is this, look, if my son is doing anything wrong, I don't know anything about it. If he's stealing money, if he's doing this, uh, I'm on parole. He does everything. I don't do anything. So he didn't stand up for me. He could have said, Hey, my son is a hundred percent. He wouldn't do anything wrong. And you guys don't have any business bringing him in here. Cause my father had juice. Mm -hmm. He could have talked like that, but he didn't. And that was very, very hurtful uh, to me. And it's something that I, I didn't forget. I mean, I forgave him for it. I forgive him now, but didn't, you know, but at the time and for a while after that, it was, it was very troublesome. That's um, uh, a fascinating um, situation. Um, it does remind you of the Godfather <laughs> and certain aspects of that. Um, but we'd also like to ask you about um, some of the other heavyweights that you uh, interacted with during uh, during your time there. And one of them is is John Gotti. And I think there's an interesting story where you actually had to have a sit down with him and his crew. And if you could talk to us about that and your impressions of of Gotti at the time. Yeah, you know, and I've been asked about John many times, and and I'll say this on a social level, um, you know, I like John a lot. Um, I, I had respect for him. I, I respected the fact that, you know, he didn't make any bones about who he was. He was a mob guy. He loved the life. This is who he wanted to be. He didn't pretend to be anything else. I, I didn't always agree with some of the things that you know he did or that I I heard he did, but you know, he probably didn't agree with things I did. I mean, it's just part of the life. But, you know, on a business level, he was extremely difficult to deal with. I mean, he was a narcissistic guy. He could never lose an argument. And it was just hard to deal with somebody on that basis. So, you know, I had, did have a run-in with him over a big uh, swap meet or flea market in Brooklyn. And it ended up, uh, we couldn't get along on it. And, it. and I ended up asking him to buy me out, which he did. He bought me out. And, uh, and he went on his way and I went on mine. And, you know, we still had a relationship after that. That's just what happens in that life. And then he did try to get involved in the gas business. He kind of backdoored it through Little Vic, you know, who was one of our guys at the time. And, and I was Little Vic from the Lucchese's? No, no, Little Vic from my family. Oh, Vic Arena, uh, Little Vic Arena. Vic Arena, yeah. yeah. 
And uh, I, I was successful in keeping him at bay on that. Um, you know, I, I didn't lose any arguments in the gas business. <laughs> so, uh, um, you know, we had a little run in there, but, you know, it, it worked out okay. So, again, you know, and then people had, you know, do I think John Gotti was good for the family? And, you know, so many people have asked me, is he the reason the family went down? I mean, the lifestyle went down. The answer to that is no, it's not the reason. The reason that life went down was because, you know, they, the government started to use the RICO indictment effectively. They started to use the Bail Reform Act effectively. They started to use the Sentencing Reform Act effectively. And they declared war on our life uh, with all three of those weapons in their arsenal. And basically, that's what happened. And you don't blame any one individual. You know, you don't blame John Gotti for the demise of the mob. That's ridiculous. What was your impression, no though, blame. As, as he was kind of riding this meteoric uh, rise in, in, in the underworld from, let's say, 85 uh, through when he got locked up, it, it, it kind of dovetailed with, with the end of, of your run. Um, can you kind of talk about what you were thinking while it was going on, while John Gotti found himself on the cover of Time magazine and everyone, every Tom, Dick, and Harry around America knew who John Gotti was? And a couple years before that, if you said John Gotti then, they wouldn't have known what you're talking about? Yeah, well, I, I knew that he was digging his own grave. It was only a matter of time before that's going to catch up with him. The government is going to win. There's no question about it. Uh, other people obviously were getting upset about it. I heard a lot of dissension at that time because of his high profile. Um, and did he like it? I think to a degree he liked it. I mean, look, you know, you're getting that kind of attention and, you know, in one way it gets in your head and it's in the other way, if you're smart, you say, look, this is going to bury me eventually. And I think John knew that, and, you know, he didn't, he didn't tell himself I'm going to continue to win. He knew it at some point. So, you know, but he was an ostentatious, outspoken, uh, you know, bravacio, or whatever the word is, bra- bravado type of guys. Braggadocio, yeah, he was that type of guy. So, so uh, he was able to deal with it. Did you or your father have any thoughts? Did you ever talk about Paul Castellano and how that all transpired in '85 when uh, Gotti took power in the Gambino family by assassinating Castellano without the approval of uh, the so-called commission? Yeah, I mean, people didn't like that, and uh, you know, I wasn't a fan of Paul's. I'll be honest with you. I had a, a run in with him early on. I wasn't even a made guy, and I had a run in with him, and and I, I wasn't a fan of his. I, I really wasn't. Um, as deep as Gotti was, just for the audience, as deep as Gotti was into the street, as much of a street guy as Gotti was, was as removed and detached from the street Castellano was by the 1980s, and and there was a real. Uh, you know, battle lines being drawn b- b- between blue collar guys and white collar guys in that Gambino family that eventually, you know, ended up exploding into this uh, mob, this this very very high profile mob assassination that took place in the the days before Christmas, nineteen eighty five. Right, but but was was Paul Castellano more of a feared guy than even Gotti was, just in terms of heritage? You know, I I don't think he was a feared guy. I think he was not a well liked guy. Well, I know he wasn't a well liked guy. I mean, people did not talk well of Paul under their breath, and you know, uh, when they felt it, uh, you know, safe not to. Uh, he wasn't a guy that was well liked. And you know, look, you hear a lot of stuff comes out on the street. You you just hear it. You're around enough. You're you know, you just hear it. And I didn't hear a lot of good things about him. You know. Um, so when he went down, I think some of the, I know, you know, the other bosses were upset with the way it went down, but I don't know if they were necessarily upset with the fact that it did go down. I mean, nobody was saying, oh, I really miss Paul, you know, that kind of a thing. But, you know, Gotti, I think uh, a lot of people thought he overstepped his, his authority in the way it was done. Well, you know, the other thing is <laughs> street life. I mean, that's how things get done sometimes. You make your move. I think he knew he was going to be in trouble, John. I mean, Paul hated him. There's no, no, uh, uh, you know, that was no secret. One so, of them was going to kill the other one. It's just a matter of who was going to strike first. I mean, it seems. It, exactly. You know, I mean, look, Paul's dead. I can't say what movie he was going to make, but he was certainly building a case against John. So let's Did kinda... you, uh, I'm sorry, Scott. Go ahead, did, did you ever meet Tommy Bellotti? I did, yeah. Oh, yeah, I met him. I met him with Paul. Um, Tommy the you know, toupee. I, I, yeah, I, you know, I, when I was uh, a recruit, you know, I used to drive uh, Andrew Russo and Tom uh, DeBella around quite a bit. And when they'd have meetings, they had meetings on several occasions with Paul. 
and Tommy Bellotti was there and a few other guys. And yeah, just to let so people know, around. Tommy Bellotti was Paul Castellano's right-hand man, driver and bodyguard. Some people called him Tommy the Toupee because he had a really bad hairpiece, and he was uh, collateral damage from the Castellano assassination where uh, Bellotti was driving him to a meeting at a steakhouse in downtown Manhattan, and when the uh, hitters hit Castellano, they also hit uh, Bellotti. Correct. Uh, I want to kind of yeah, take so us. I mean, so go, sorry. Them, so, go ahead, Mike. No, so I'm so I was in their company, you know, not often, but enough. So, Mike, let's kind of. Uh, I want to kind of hit on some 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 pop culture uh, touchstones here. Let's go to like 1984. Michael Jackson and his brothers are reuniting for a uh, a, a worldwide concert tour. And there's a you know Michael Jackson at that point was was the biggest um, you know music star you know in the world, and there was some uh, shakedown efforts by the Colombo family to get their kind of hooks into that concert uh, tour. Was that is that correct? You know, not really. I mean, I, I I wouldn't call it a shakedown. Norbert Walters, who I'm sure you know who he was, he was a talent agent. Um, and he uh, he represented a lot of the major black acts at the time for their tours. And I'm talking about all the majors, you know, from, from Marvin Gaye on down, Dion Warwick, you name it, Norby represented them. And Norby was originally around my dad. Um, I knew Norby as Uncle Norby. I knew him my entire life. He had a, uh, a club in, in Manhattan, uh, not too far from the Copacabana, I think it was across the street. It was called the Norby Walters, and my father was his partner there. So they had a long history, and when my dad went away, I kind of took Norby over. And um, so when the tour came out, you know, Norby uh, was talking to Joe Jackson, and we were supposed to represent uh, Michael on the tour. It wasn't a shakedown. I mean, we were supposed to represent them on the victory tour. And for some reason, there was dissension, and Michael didn't want to do anything that Joe Jackson wanted to do, and so on and so forth. So, right. I, I believe yeah. that Joe Jackson... You know, the the family was begging Michael, please involve the brothers in this thing. This is the biggest he had tour passed of all the time. He had passed the brothers by at right. that point. I mean, they were begging him. Yeah, they need the brothers needed Michael. Michael didn't need the Jackson Five. That's correct. And you know, long story short, we were supposed to represent him in the tour, and uh, and Michael didn't want it. He wanted I forget the guy that he wanted. I, I think of his name. But so that's what it was about. It wasn't a shakedown. It was just a legitimate representation of Michael on the tour. And, uh, and that's what it was all about. And, you know, I think, uh, you know, the name Tommy Vastola, Corky. Yeah, Corky Vastola, who was uh, a yeah. uh, Del- De Calvicante, uh, New Jersey crime family uh, capo. Eventually, I believe he might have been the underboss. And he was very involved in the music business along with uh, Morris Levy, Roulette Records and all that stuff, right? Correct. You, you got it. And so, you know, Koki, I met with him at the time and he wanted to get involved and so on and so forth. And so we kind of combined our efforts and, uh, and, and we did have a part of the tour. It wasn't what we wanted because, you know, Michael basically called the shots there. And so, look, if it was a shakedown, then there would have been a lot more to it. I mean, Michael would have been, you know, met with uh, personally and there would have been a little bit more to it. But it never got to that. And I can tell you because I was... I was right in the middle of that. Now, was that so, before? Uh, was that before he was represented by Frank DeLeo, or it, it, did you know was, Frank? I, I knew Frank afterwards. Yeah, I didn't know him before. I, I, you know what? Correct me. I don't think Frank represented him at that point in time because we would have talked to Frank at that time, but we did not. And I met Frank. You know, I mean, he died, but I met him after that. Was there, a, in the, in, Mike? Was the there a relationship between your dad and? Um, Morris Levy. Yeah, what was your dad's relationship Morris, with Mo Levy? Yeah, I, I mean, look, he wasn't with my dad. Um, but, yeah, you know, we had Buddha Records at the time. We had Casablanca Records. My dad was involved with them. Neil Bogart? And, uh, Neil Bogart and um, uh, what were the other two guys? Bogart, uh, Steinberg, Phil Steinberg. And, uh, oh, gosh, the other guy that I became friends with, I can't think of his name now. He's, he's out here with me. I haven't seen him in a little while, but. Uh, but yeah, so my father was involved and they crossed paths with Morris a couple of times, but, uh, Morris was more, was closer to Tommy Vestola, to Corky at that time. What was your but dad's, yeah, dad what was your dad's relationship with David Kenner, the attorney that eventually ended up representing some of the, uh, death row rappers? What wasn't their relationship between Sonny and Kenner? No, I don't, I don't think my dad ever knew. Kenner's out here. Um, I knew David. I don't think my dad ever met him or knew him. Okay. 
Yeah, well, David came around later on. Remember, the, the rap, my father wasn't involved with these rappers because that came later. Right. My, my dad went away in 1970. Right. And the real rap, you know, the rap thing. Until the 80s and 90s. I would say, right. It didn't start till the 80s and the 90s, yeah. So he wasn't involved in that. He was involved in a lot of the bubblegum stuff. He had the Shangri-Las at the time. He mm. had... Uh, Tommy James. You know, Tommy James and the Shandells and all wow. those. The, the, uh, Buddha Records was, was a big label. Casablanca was a big label at the time, so... Was Mo, uh, was Mo Levy looked at as a gangster, or was he looked at as a, a, a Jewish mob associate that benefited from who he was connected to? Or or did people honestly fear Mo Levy? Well, they feared Mo Levy because of his connections. you got to understand something. If for made guys, anybody that wasn't a made guy was a sucker. <laughs> I don't care if he's the president of the United States. He's a sucker. He's not a made guy. He's a sucker. And they were all treated that way. So, uh, you know, when, when you hear of a, a, a non-made guy having so much authority or power, it only comes from his relationship. As far as we're concerned, he's a sucker. That's how it went at that time. And again, I'm not talking current day. I'm talking back when we were in that life. And we were told that. Anybody that's not a made guy, he's a sucker. I don't care he's, who he is. He's a mark. He's a potential mark for you to take down. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. What about Don King? Did you guys have some interactions with him? Well, I did. Um, you know, I don't know if you re- remember that whole undercover investigation, shadow boxing, that uh, th- was uh, myself and Don King were the targets. And uh, Al Sharpton was involved in that. And, um, you know, they tried to, uh, uh, the feds tried to infiltrate boxing and tried to get something on me and King to show that there was a relationship and that the boxing world was run by the mob and so on and so forth. They had a a whole year undercover investigation on me, and um, I introduced them actually to Don King. But prior to the meeting, I made Don know that, look, I don't know these guys, you know, past, I've, I've been with them seven or eight months before I brought them to you, but I still can't, um, I can't verify their existence prior to that. So you need to have a discussion that's totally above board. And the whole thing was taped. It was totally above board, and the investigation never went anywhere. They had to kill it. But, um, you know, that was my relationship. Yeah, and Don, Don was a player with us, and, you know, he was involved with some guys in Cleveland. Right. How, but, much uh, were we you aware, how much were you aware of his activities back before he became a boxing promoter? He was one of the biggest policy number kingpins out of Cleveland, Ohio, worked very closely with the Scalish crime family. How much of that did you know when he started doing business with him? Well, I knew, knew all about his past relationships. I mean, not in great detail, but we knew he was connected to those guys, and we knew he had street sense, and, and uh, you know, we knew, we knew where he was coming from. So, um, you know, I had no problem dealing with him uh, at all. all right. And Sharpton was our go-between. Let's kind of wrap up by kind of bringing this back to our wheelhouse here in Detroit, um, where, where we're taping this right now. Uh, I've read some interviews with you and um, been, you know, when I've been obviously following being a, a, a mob aficionado, a, a researcher, an author, I, I've, I've followed uh, Michael, you know, your your career since you got out of prison and your, your reinvention. Um, but I've also seen you talk a little bit about uh, the Jimmy Hoffa disappearance, which in Detroit is, you know, one of the biggest stories in, in the history of Michigan. And it's something that still comes up every couple months, every year or two, there's another dig. Uh, they're still looking for this guy, you know, almost 45 years later. Um, can you give us uh, some, some perspective on what you guys were hearing back in the 1970s in New York about what was happening with Hoffa here in Detroit? Well, listen, you know, look, I mean, let's go through the facts. The fact was he came out of prison, wanted to regain control of the union, and guys in our life did not want that to happen, specifically guys from New England and, you know, Raymond Patriarch, you know, the whole crew, and, and certainly our guy up in Buffalo, but they didn't want that to happen. And, you know, he basically <laughs> wrote his own ticket. Now, you know, I will comment on this, and I'm not, I have nothing to gain and nothing to lose, and it'll go no further than this, I'm sure. But I do not believe, you know, to any degree, the movie that's coming out, you know, I, I paint houses or whatever. <laughs> I don't believe the story that was told by Frank Sheehan. I happen to know differently from an extremely reliable source. Um, I know that the order uh, came from New York. Okay, to take him down. And I know who one of the shooters is, you know, I believe. And, I, you know, I also believe that, you know, the way they said they disposed of the body, I don't think that's true. I really don't. 
And I've, I've known this for a lot of years. You know, it's funny that actually somebody in a few years ago gave me some tapes that talked about the whole thing, and I still have them, uh, with, with one of the shooters. So I've never done anything with him. I'm not trying to pull a Geraldo Rivera and, you know, the empty <laughs> safe thing and all that stuff, but because it, it, it's nothing for me to gain or lose, but I, I don't believe the story. Now, I'm sure it's going to be a good movie. You know, you got a great cast and you got Scorsese. It's going to be a good movie. But I don't think there's credibility behind it. I think the guy sold some books and, and great. You know, like a few other people that knew exactly what happened to Jimmy Hoffa, you know, when they, they dig up the whole, you know, backyard or front yard of that house. Or you, if you remember that? Yeah, I've, yeah. I've, cov- I've been doing this for 12 years now. I've covered about five or six digs already in my 12 yeah. years of, of reporting on, on organized crime in Detroit. So, yeah, like I said, it's a, it's a rite of passage for people growing up in Detroit. Uh, you know, my my childhood home was literally about five minutes from where Hoffa was kidnapped. And uh, I actually went and saw the, the Jack Nicholson, Jimmy Hoffa movie at the multiplex, which <laughs> stood in the shadow of what used to be the Red oh, Fox, where, where Hoffa had his last uh, stand and was kidnapped mm. from. Uh, Did, as we're getting ready to wrap up here, uh, is there anything you'd like to share with us about your latest projects? I know you're always working on various exciting anything things. Anything you want to and, promote, let people uh, know where yeah, they can find you. Your, your website, your books, anything you would like to share with our audience? Well, I appreciate that. You know, I'm, I'm all over social media. I'm on Instagram and, and Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and all of that. Um, you know, my latest projects, obviously, I'm, I'm, I'm a prolific speaker and, you know, I'm doing a, a tour in the United Kingdom um, coming October, November, and I've got a lot of dates coming up here. Um, as always, I've been doing that for 20 some odd years now got another book that I'm writing. Um, it's a political book. Can't give the title yet or anything, but uh, hopefully it'll be out next year if I keep on deadline, which I normally don't, but I'm trying my hardest. <laughs> we feel you on that. Yeah, believe me. I'm, yeah. For guys that have published books before, we know what it feels <laughs> yeah. like to have a deadline yeah, looming. I'm sympathetic. <laughs> Oh, uh, it's so hard. I've never made one yet. But I'm <laughs> I don't think they're meant to be made. I think they're meant to be pushed back four or five times. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And they, they put up with me for some reason. But uh, so I'm doing that. And then, um, you know, I'm starting something new. That they, Just so you know, I have finally agreed after 20 years. And, and not that, you know, it was always my decision because this movie business is crazy. But um, we are in active development in a movie on my life. Awesome. And I think it's going to, yeah, I think it's going to happen. I'm also involved with a major, major production company on a television series. Um, and it's, it's going to be entitled Gas Wars. It's oh, built around oh, nice. the gas business. That's great. So uh, they're both in active, very active development now. And something that I'm starting now that I've been asked to do for the past couple of years, but just didn't feel it, um, but I am now, and, and that'll be launched, I think, October 1st. I'm going to be a personal and business coach, and uh, we're actually starting a business in that regard. And one of the reasons I'm doing that is because I get asked all the time, you know, just business questions, personal questions. When, you know, somebody's got a high profile and they've been through a lot of stuff in their life, people tend to ask you questions. And, you know, I've, I've, I've been so, honestly, guys, so fortunate and so blessed to, I believe, have an impact on people's lives, really through my faith and my testimony and what I share on a weekly basis, sometimes a daily basis. And so I feel moved to do that now, and I'm excited about it. And it might be something that keeps me off of an airplane a little bit more because I, I travel so much and my wife kind of put her foot down, you know, a few months back and said, you know, you're getting a little older now. We've got grandkids. And it's just same way from the same way more. from your book, Cammy. Yes. Yes. Yeah. yes we're, we're going on 35 years. That's pretty so amazing. Uh, he wrote, uh, Michael wrote a book called Quitting the Mob, uh, and he really goes into detail in his love affair and romance and, and finding uh, Cammy as, a, as his soulmate. She and, saved his life. Yeah. Basically. Right. <laughs> correct. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. No doubt about it. You know, I don't meet her. I'm dead or in prison. For the you, and you don't usually life, get so. those type of that nuance in, in mob bios. It's usually just a lot of blood and guts. And this kind of, you know, lets you into a real personal side of Michael that I, I really connected with when I when I read his book. And um, the last thing I, I want to ask you. It, so it, I know that you go around on behalf of of. I think of the NCAA, NFL, NBA, those kind of uh, sporting organizations, and you do talks to their athletes, kind of warning them of the dangers of betting and and mob guys maybe trying to infiltrate professional sports. Do you still do that? Oh, yeah. I was uh, was with Alabama uh, last week with with, uh, Coach Saban. 
Uh, Nick has taken me to every team he's had, LSU, Miami, Alabama a couple of times. So, uh, yeah, we share that information. I give them the benefit of my experience, tell them why they shouldn't be gambling, who they got to watch out for, um, you know, be careful of the relationships that they make and keep. And, and uh, you know, it's been a good, a good program. Now I've been doing it since 96. Wow. So um, not only with the pros, but with all the collegiate sports. And uh, I'll be in Iowa, Iowa or Idaho. Idaho or Iowa in the next week or so. I forget which one. But, yeah, I do that. You know, I'm getting called a lot now. I did that quite a bit and then had to back off because of other things that I was doing. But since they, uh, you know, the Supreme Court came down with that decision to allow sports betting in, in all 50 states, I've been getting a lot of calls now from the schools again and been doing a lot. I, I feel kind of obligated to them because I started speaking as a result of uh, the pro sports uh, really recruiting me. And then the NCAA jumped on board in 98. So I've done over 300 colleges. Wow. I think and, people, tell me if, if you think this is accurate. I think people would be shocked if they found out how much point spread manipulation is going on on a day-to-day basis in college sports. I mean, I, I'm of the belief that probably one in every five games that you're watching has some type of manipulation going on behind the scenes. And I don't think people have any clue that, that, that that's happening. No, we, you know, people need to understand that the money is, is tremendous, very, very significant, and it's all about the point spread. It's not about winning or losing. It's about the point spread. And, uh, you know, if you can manipulate the spread, you know, over the course of a season or a number of games, you can make yourself, uh, you know, quite a bit of money. And uh, there's professionals that know how to do that. And there's guys on the street that'll take advantage of it. And I tell these guys, it's not only street guys; it's just guys that have a that want to gamble and that are in the business of gambling, or or do it as a as a frequent habit. You got to watch out for these people. And um, you know, these these athletes, they think they're sophisticated and they think they know a lot, but they got a lot to learn. They're not a match for guys on the street that you know. That, that <laughs> well, and some of these doing. guys, you look That's at you, you look at the 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 record on some of these point shaving scandals over the years in college and it's like a guy that's going to be an NBA draft pick or an NFL draft pick will throw their entire pro career away for, you know, a $20,000 payday when that would be yeah. like one weekly check for them if they just held out for another 2 years. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> They're you so short sighted. You know, some and not all of them obviously, but you know, there are there are those out there that are kind of easy to manipulate. Yeah. And you know, you put green in front of them and uh, you know, the eyes go get big. And you convince them you're not you're not yeah. losing the game, you're just you know, you're just not winning by as many as you're supposed to, so they can kind of play mental gymnastics with their in their head that oh well I'm not really costing my team, uh, you know, it's not costing us in the win loss column. But at the end of the day, uh point shaving is point shaving and uh, I think that the, what you do uh you know is very important going around and, and giving those type of type of talks. Because I'm guessing that you know 99% of the athletes you talk to are just totally in the dark about this world that is such a slippery slope. Oh, yeah. You know, I'll tell you this. This is a, a scary statistic, but it's true. You know, whenever I go to a school, I tell them straight out, you know, a lot of times we'll do just the football team, just the basketball team. Then quite often we'll do all the student athletes, you know, from male and female from every sport. And I tell them straight out, I said, look, I don't work for the school. I don't work for the NCAA. I'm a hired gun. I come in here. I do my thing because I care about you people. I don't want to see you getting in trouble. I said, so here's the deal. You got a gambling situation. You know somebody that has a gambling situation. You got a problem. You owe some money. Here's my email address. Email me. I said, don't give me your name. I don't need to do anything. I want to help you out. I can probably give you the right advice and help you out with whatever you're going through. Guys, I will tell you this. I've done over 300 probably 350 at this point in time. It hasn't failed yet. By the time I get back to my hotel room, I have emails from somebody in that room, okay, that's going through a gambling situation. Only one time have I had to convince somebody, uh, a student athlete, uh, to go to their coach. I said, you're you're in trouble. There's no doubt about it, and it's going to get worse. And if you don't go and hold this off now, you're going to be in real trouble. And he took my advice, and they were able to deal with it quietly. Um, you know, without going any further, but it is a situation. It is a problem. And, you know, look, with our pros, is it a problem? I don't think so. These guys have enough money now. Do they gamble? Of course. Are they normally bad gamblers? In my experience, yes. (laughs) I don't know what it is, you know, but, um, but they don't have a problem. They can pay their debts. They can pay. They're not going to throw a game normally. I mean, I don't think you're going to see that often from the pros, but the kids in college is a different story. 
these kids get in trouble for a couple of grand and they're 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 ripe you know they're they're prime you know to have a a, a real situation for themselves if they get in, in front of the wrong person and right re- now i tell them the wrong person is out there looking for you guys all the time it's not like one in a million they're out there all the time looking for you you give them an opening and you're going to meet that person i guarantee it so you got to, you know, really have them put up their guard and be careful who they talk to and watch out what kind of information they spread and who they associate with and who's asking them certain questions. And they're not wise to this, and they need to know it. And, you know, when they hear it from me, I'll tell you what I do, and then if you want to wrap it up, we can. Sure. When I go in, I'll get – I tell the coach, I say, look, I want all your linemen up front. I want the biggest guys first row, front of the room. And he'll do that. And throughout the course of my talk, I'll walk over to, let's say, I got, uh, you know, offensive guard, right? He's 360 pounds. He's six foot five. I'll tell him, stand up. And he'll look at me like, you know, I said, stand up. Will you <laughs> stand up? You're three times my size. So he'll stand up. I said, let me ask you a question. I said, you know, on the field, I said, I wouldn't come close to you. I said, you would tear me up. You'd eat me up. You'd put you, you know, I'd be in my grave. I said, no doubt about it. But then what I'll do, I'll walk in front of him and I'll draw this kind of line with my foot. And I say, but let me explain something to you, my friend. You step over this line, you come into my business, I'm going to make a sissy out of you. I'm going to eat you up alive <laughs> and there ain't nothing you're going to do about it. Not a thing. I said, so you want to try me? And he'll look around. And I say, okay, sit down. <laughs> I'm telling you, you got to see the whole room gets quiet because you got to make them understand this is not a game. This is not a game with people. You know, when you're talking this kind of money, uh, it's not a game anymore. And they got to understand that. Nobody's worried about their size or anything else. It don't mean a thing. There's that 30. Yeah, I, I got clear. Mike, there's that 30. I don't know if you saw it, but there's that 30 for 30 ESPN did about Jimmy the Gent Burke uh, uh, shaving points with Boston College uh, back in the late 70s basketball. And one of the guys that was 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 kind of compromised and shaving points was having some second thoughts and uh i think it was henry hill said you know how, how, how do you think you're gonna like uh shooting free throws next week uh with your arm broke so exactly it's like it's pretty sobering to, to understand how deep you've gotten in if, if you haven't realized it up until that point exactly no i mean if look and they gotta understand that i mean that's the reality of it you know and one other thing i want to say for some reason, I've been asked this a lot lately, and it's on social media, so I know it's on people's minds, and mostly people that follow the mob and all of that, not not people that are not in, into this at all. But people ask me, you know, did, was this guy feared more than another guy? Did everybody fear John Gotti? Was this guy there? And I, I, I explained to them, I said, listen, we didn't have to fear anybody because who they were personally, because every one of us, we're capable of doing what we had to do. Every one of us, or we wouldn't be part of that life. So it's not a question that you fear an individual, that that person is going to beat you up or best you. I says, but what you do, there is a healthy fear of not making a mistake to put yourself in a position where somebody like that can take advantage of you. So if you know you're around a treacherous guy, like, look, in a lot of ways, I love Persico. I love Junior. But I knew he was a very treacherous guy. That was his reputation. And I knew that if, you know, you crossed him the wrong way, uh, you had to be on your guard. Now, I will tell you this. When I left that life, he was extremely upset. I mean, I heard one story. Him and I were in Lompoc, uh, federal prison. I was in the medium. He was in the penitentiary. He got a copy of my book. And one of the hacks, one of the guards told me that he's in the, in the cell. He started tearing up the pages, throwing it against the wall. I mean, he went crazy. So he took it extremely personal. And I knew what type of guy Junior was. And if he was out on the street, and I would, I would have had a problem. It, it might have been, you know, me or him or something had to be done. And I'm not saying I would have done anything. You know, don't get me wrong, but I'm trying to explain. It would have been a problem. Of course, he was locked up and, and his hands were tied and a lot of stuff was going on in that life. But, you know, so I knew that. So did I have a fear of what? this guy could do if I left my guard down? Sure, because I knew what type of guy he was. But that doesn't mean that I would not have acted first because, look, all these guys that had that reputation, they all got killed. Every one of them. Because you're not going to allow a guy like that to be a loose parent. You're going to take care of business so that you don't have to worry about somebody like that. And that's what people need to understand. It wasn't that we had fear of an individual. We were all capable of doing what we had to do. What we had to fear was was making a mistake 
and allowing a treacherous person to take advantage of us in a way. So I don't know what put that in my head other than no, the fact that's, that that's fine. That was perfect. Yeah, we appreciate yeah. your insight, Michael. I mean, we don't. It, it's it, we're very fortunate to have someone with your experience. Uh, and and we're happy that you're still around. It's remarkable that you're still here, considering the people. And Roberto is that- <laughs> actually starting a new, or has has started a new podcast over these last couple of weeks with his other radio partners. Yeah, about in, sports all about gambling. sports betting called Cash the Ticket. Yeah, so this will give some oh, good insight if, for them as well. Well, Michael, thank you very much. We really appreciate your time, and um, uh, tell Lisa thank you very much for helping uh, for coordinating this with me. She was very friendly, and very great. I appreciate her. Yeah, you're, you're the life. Well. You're the lifeblood. Uh, people like yourself are the lifeblood of this type of operation that we're running here with the original gangsters podcast people like you coming on sharing their life stories uh you know coloring up uh, a life that's already so colorful but giving us insight and nuance and context that most people aren't able to get and and we can't thank you enough you're always welcome to come back here if you're ever promoting anything yeah you, know, please you ever, ever want to you know chime in with anything that's going on uh current events wise always a friend of the og podcast mike francis uh, you know, a, a, a true gentleman of, of the underworld. Thank you, Michael. Well, guys, thank you. I appreciate it. And thanks for your understanding and, and bearing with yep. us to get this done. So we appreciate it. This yeah, guy was way no ahead worries. of the, for, this guy was way ahead of the curve in terms of where the mafia was going 30, 40 years ago and really envision what, what organized crime was going to look like in 2020. Uh, Mike was doing it back in 1980. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you, Michael. All right, guys. Appreciate it. I'm sure we'll be in touch again. Take yeah, care. great. Thanks, Mike. Take care. All right.